Hello and a warm welcome to the latest event at the World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. I'm Michelle Flurry, BBC Business Correspondent, and I'm delighted to be your host over the next hour or so. The issue we are focusing on today couldn't be more important. The World Bank Group estimates that 100 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty because of the COVID-19 pandemic. All the progress we've made in education, healthcare, social protection is at risk. The need for action is urgent. This year has been like no other, affecting all of our lives personally and professionally, but it's the poorest and most vulnerable who face the greatest impact. So how is COVID-19 changing the way governments are protecting and investing in people? How have response measures planted the seeds for a more inclusive recovery? And how can we reimagine the delivery of essential services in response to the pandemic while building a more resilient recovery? That's what we want to explore over the next hour. We're going to be hearing about the current response, the challenges ahead, and we're going to begin to build a vision for a future that puts protecting and investing in people at the centre of national and global agendas. We have an incredible lineup of guests from around the world who can help us understand the challenges and the solutions. And before I introduce our guests, let me remind you of the many ways you can take part in this special event. We are, of course, streaming live in English, Spanish, French and Arabic on World Bank Live, where experts are already taking your questions on the live chat. And of course, you can join the conversation at any time just using the hashtag invest in people. That hashtag again, invest in people. But first, here's a look at what's coming up over the next hour. Very impressive and a truly global lineup. And in the next hour, we'll be hearing from Turkey, Uruguay, India, South Africa, West Bank and Gaza and Guinea. We'll hear from young people whose lives have been upended from this pandemic and also from health workers on the front lines of the fight against COVID-19. First though, let's take a look at the challenges we are facing in human development. As you saw there, just some of the challenges being faced in human development. Now, think about this, more than a billion children are out of school, health services are limited in many countries, women and children are especially affected, and very often there are no social safety nets. How does the international community respond to this enormous challenge? How do we protect a generation and create a resilient and inclusive recovery? 
To answer these important questions, I'm joined now by Mari Pangestu, the World Bank's Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships. Uh, and as many of you know, Mari was a cabinet minister in Indonesia before joining the World Bank and knows just how important investing in people is for increasing equity and economic growth. Uh, Mari, if I could start by asking you about the recently released 2020 Human Capital Index, what did it tell us about the outcomes we've seen from investments in people and the possible impacts of COVID-19? Well, I think the good news coming out of uh, the, the recently re, re, uh, update of the Human Capital Index is that uh, because we took a 10-year uh, backward look between 2010 and 2020, more children than ever received health care and attended school. Uh, and this is important because those investments in people are key to unlocking a child's potential and improving economic growth around the, uh, around the world. Uh, but sadly, uh, uh, COVID-19 threatens to wipe out uh, many of these impressive gains uh, and leaving a potential lost generation uh, as countries struggle to contain virus and save lives and rebuild their economies. The World Bank is estimating that uh, about 71 to 100 million people will uh, go into extreme poverty, uh, measured at the international poverty line of $1.90 a day, and that 1.6 children uh, are out of school, uh, and there will be a permanent loss in education and learning with trillions of dollars lost in uh, earnings for this generation of students. So uh, we, I think our challenge ahead okay. is how do we preserve the human capital gains that have been made uh, and, and prevent a reversal? So, I mean, how does the World Bank support countries as they're trying to deal with the impact of, of this pandemic? Well, the World Bank has been, I would say, very fast in its response uh, to the emergency health situation. Uh, we have deployed uh, in, in just the last few months a program uh, of 200 countries to address the immediate uh, health, uh, health impact uh, by providing the equipment, the essential uh, medical supplies and so on. But beyond the health crisis, we're also uh, looking at how do we protect lives, livelihoods, as well as human capital. Uh, so social safety nets obviously play a very important role. And we have actually uh, ramped up our investments in cash transfers by 10 billion uh, and, and, over, and it will continue to roll, roll uh, over for the next 12 months. And it's affecting 1.1 billion uh, people. It's reaching 1.1 billion, billion of the most poorest and vulnerable. Uh, and on, on education, we are working with 65 countries providing technical assistance and financial support. Because you know, as schools have closed, uh, you have to th uh, think about how do we uh, deploy uh, uh, remote learning in countries where uh, internet uh, access is not uh, something which is uh, uh, widely available. So you actually have to be very creative in your solutions. A no tech solution using traditional methods, whether it's TV, radio, or even a simple handphone, uh, to uh, low tech and high tech uh, to ensure that uh, we can uh, have uh, remote learning uh, be, be undertaken. And uh, how do we also address the differential impact of the crisis on different vulnerable groups, women and girls being uh, one particular group, because 70% uh, of healthcare workers are women. Yeah. Uh, women are the ones that, that are being affected most in terms of job losses in the informal sector and service industry. They have to stay home to take care of uh, children and family. They're also uh, most more exposed to uh, gender-based violence. And girls uh, are, are uh, more affected in terms of the schooling and, and later on when, we, when schools can open, reopen safely, going back to school. So these, you know, we have to uh, make sure that we are addressing the vulnerable uh, uh, populations uh, in, in the policy responses that we are. I mean, one of the things that's been fascinating is the pandemic has exposed weaknesses uh, and gaps in existing systems. Uh, I, I'm just curious, you know, how can a country's response today help address some of these enormous challenges that you've described? That's a really good question. And, and that's really what I think all, we, are, we are humbled by this experience, let's say. Uh, you know, we use our past experience from crisis and our uh, instincts about good policy and so on. 
but we are all, I think, learning and adapting. I think the key is how do we, uh, as the situation is so fluid and, and uh, things are happening very quickly, how do we adapt to the situation, self-correct, and then as we are doing that, find the opportunity to build back better. And I think today we are gonna be talking more about that, but let me just uh, highlight uh, some of the things that are coming out just as we are uh, rolling out our programs. On social protection, uh, these programs used to be very targeted to the extreme poor, but in this crisis, it's it's a broad, the impact is broad. So we've had to broaden uh, the target, make it broader and scale it up. And uh, how do you identify beneficiaries? This is part of the adaptation that was needed, the data that needs to be there. And then hopefully that data can be used to, uh, to build back uh, better systems. And then adapting it also to that, it's not just cash. Some people need food, some people need jobs, some people need uh, uh, livelihoods and the youth need unemployment benefits. On education, uh, remote learning, uh, I mentioned uh, how uh, it's not just about the internet and online learning. How do we go back to the television and the transistor radio uh, also to help uh, remote learning and help uh, learning at home? Because uh, uh, not everybody can go back to school. And even when you go back to school, how do you catch up the learning losses? There has to be learning at home. And then mobile banking for cash transfers. That's another uh, another innovation and creativity that's happening uh, as, as we are uh, working on the ground. And uh, as you are delivering health services for the pandemic, how do you make sure you don't uh, forget about the other important health uh, services like maternal health or children vaccination? And then as you're doing this, you have to continue to improve and strengthen the health systems. So this is kind of the, the learning on the ground. And we are really, uh, I think it's all about adapting, adjusting uh, and uh, building back uh, better, you know, building systems, data uh, and better uh, delivery and monitoring uh, uh, of the services that we need to deliver. That's a, a good place to end on a positive note, an opportunity there to, to build back better. Yeah. Um, a big thank you to Mari Pangestu, uh, the World Bank Group's Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships. Thank you, Michelle. I'm Luis Osorio Flores in Washington, D.C., and you're watching the World Bank IMF Annual Meetings. A big thank you to Mari Pangestu from the World Bank. And just to remind everybody that you can post your questions in the live chat. We'll be answering as many as your questions as possible in a special live event, which takes place immediately after this in the World Bank Group's atrium in Washington, DC. And of course, you can always share your thoughts, your comments, just use the hashtag invest in people. Frontline workers around the world have become the heroes of this pandemic, risking their lives to protect ours. Let's take a moment to hear the challenges they face. The biggest challenge for me as a caregiver for patients with COVID-19 was not seeing my family for a very long period of time. My unit has only COVID-19 patients. The biggest challenge is when I'm intubating a patient that needs ventilation support to keep breathing. I need to be really fast and really precise dealing with COVID patients. Since when it comes to this, they are facing imminent risk of death. COVID-19 has brought a lot of issues in this community. You can see the young girls became pregnant because they couldn't afford online learning. In their houses, there's a lot of gender-based violence because the parents were sucked out of their jobs. Nos offres c'est essentiellement la planification familiale et la santé de la mère et de la reproduction. Mais depuis l'avènement du Covid-19 au Sénégal, on a eu pas mal d'obstacles pour continuer nos consultations. The biggest challenge for me this Covid-19 in my work has been the fact that our clients can't come through physically to our offices to access our mental health services. The biggest challenge is to keep the medical staff safe, strong and motivated and trying very hard to keep them safe from burnout syndrome. Several of my colleagues got in sick, so we are trying to save patients, but we also need to protect ourselves. I am responding to this challenge by uh, taking the extreme precaution to the virus to avoid uh, infecting in ourselves and others. On the good side, COVID-19 has become a catalyst for the adoption of telemedicine. So we launched the first teleguided do-it-yourself swab test 
and that reduces the spread of infection, improves the turnaround time of results and reduces stigmatization. We have taken advantage of digital platforms and virtualized all our sessions and are now conducting our sessions online. We are racing to save lives while also ensuring the vaccine is safe and effective. There is an enormous amount of data for me to observe every day and I am working longer hours to ensure that we get this right at this moment. We just want to do our best and the feeling that we are doing something that matters. We just want to make them, them feel safe and we provide them the care that they need. So humbling to hear those stories and a good reminder of why the subject of this session, protecting and investing in people, is so important. Okay, so this is the point at which we want to hear from you, the audience. We're going to be running a live poll throughout this event, and we are asking this question. Which of these will be most important for a resilient, inclusive recovery from COVID-19? Is it A, delivering vaccines to the most vulnerable, B, safely reopening schools, C, providing cash to struggling families, or D, ensuring girls and women have equal access to jobs. Once again, the question is, which of these will be most important for a resilient, inclusive recovery from COVID-19? Is it A, delivering vaccines to the most vulnerable, uh, B, safely reopening schools, C, providing cash to struggling families, or D, ensuring girls and women have equal access to jobs? Now, you can cast your vote on World Bank Live and the final results will be revealed during the live show that follows right after this event, so do stay tuned. We'll also be putting your questions directly to the bank's top experts in that show. I'm Yasmina Hadjic in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. If you've joined us just now, a big welcome. This event on protecting and investing in people is the third public event of the World Bank Group. But don't worry, if you've missed anything, you can watch all the previous events and check what's coming up on World Bank Live. Now, our next guest has made gender equity a focus of her work over the past decade and knows that empowering women and girls can bring transformational improvements in the health and prosperities of not just families, but also communities and societies. Her work has led her to focus increasingly on gender equity as a path to meaningful change. Melinda Gates is the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and when I spoke to her earlier, I asked her how women and men were being affected differently by the pandemic. Well, we're seeing it show up in incredible ways. I mean, while we know that more men are dying from COVID, when you look at the statistics, it is affecting women deeply because what happens, and we know this from good data from the Ebola pandemic, is you have these shadow pandemics. You have a shadow pandemic of domestic violence, you have maternal mortality, we're already seeing it on the rise. Just like in the Ebola crisis, we lost 5,000 more women's lives than we would have otherwise because they didn't wanna go in the health system because of Ebola being there. The forecast is that we'll lose an additional 115,000 women's lives from the shadow pandemic of maternal mortality and the health system not feeling safe for women. Um, and as well on the economic front, women are losing their jobs at twice the rate that men are. We know that they're not having as much access to the capital markets right now. And as well, we know that while they're losing their jobs, the burden of unpaid labor is going up because women are two and a half times more likely to do the unpaid labor in their house. Now there's the labor of the children at home and caring for the elderly. So it is a huge disproportionate effect on women. So it sounds like it's the social environment as well as the health issue that's really behind this. Absolutely. And I think one thing people don't sometimes realize also is when we think of who are our healthcare workers in countries, 70% of those are women. <laughs> so they are really at the front and center of this crisis. You said you see an opportunity for huge change. What is the risk of not doing anything, of not addressing this? If we don't put women at the front and center of this agenda, we are going to have a very 
very slow recovery. You know, we have to get global trade fully up and running again. And so it means we have to think about everybody else. We have to think about people in low income countries because COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere. And so if we only focused on high income countries or high and middle income countries, you're not going to have the supply chains we need to keep everything going. And so I think it's a, it's a risk that if we only think of ourselves and our community or our country or our state, we're not going to get this recovery up and running, get the flywheel up and running as quickly. And so we have to think about things like the World Bank thinks about human, what they call human capital, which is really people's health, their education, their economic opportunity, and their voice. And we're seeing citizens speak up because remember, all of a sudden COVID is exposing these cracks in societies that we've had, these inequities. And so you're seeing the road to recovery is going to be very slow if we don't get those four things up and running well. Melinda Gates, thank you so much for your time and lots to think about there. Thank you, Michelle. Glad we could speak. Melinda Gates there speaking to me earlier. A quick mention of another opportunity to engage. As you know, uh, resilient recovery is the theme of these meetings. And we're asking you to send us photos of what resilience means to you. We're adding these pictures to a virtual mosaic and you can see how that's shaping up and upload your own pictures on our website. Now, we know that young people have been especially affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. They miss out on school or university, face unemployment, have to support family members and encounter gender violence or depression. Let's hear from young people around the world about their experiences, their fears and also their hopes. COVID-19 को संख्या हाम्रो देश नेपालमा दिन प्रतिदिन बढ्दै गएको छ। परिवारको सदस्यलाई नभेटेको महिनो भएको छ। साथै वाय दैनिक क्रियाकलापहरुमा पनि ठप्प आएको छ। I'm graduating in a few months and now the labor pool has become much more competitive than ever before. The travel ban and the travel restriction do not allow me to explore my job opportunity abroad or advance my career in the way that I want to. I'm a teacher in a private senior high school here in Ghana. And due to the pandemic, schools have been closed down for some months now. But unfortunately, unlike the government sector, most private schools have been unable to pay their staff since then. Apart from putting the health sector at risk and stress, this pandemic has brought other ramifications in other spheres of life as well. The incidences of domestic violence in my country are on the rise. You know, we've seen uh, gender-based violence going up, we've seen depression cases going up, and we just need the government to support us in terms of access to psychosocial support, access to cash transfers, access to food distributions. A resident recovery will only come if countries invest heavily in the heresy sector. And this also is the area where youth can play key role through innovation. I believe in two things, unity and strategy. We Peruvians are strong, resilient and enthusiastic people. We will overcome this. Just make we continue, look out for each other and help each other. It's amazing to see all of those young people who live around the world and yet the challenges they face are similar. I'm Hai Ian in Hanoi, Vietnam and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meeting. Well, let's move now to Africa, where COVID-19 continues to take hold across the continent and the situation is evolving quickly. The pandemic is taking a toll on lives and economies, pushing the region into its first recession in 25 years. President Ramaphosa of South Africa, also currently chairperson of the African Union, sent us this message for a more inclusive and resilient recovery. Leaders of the World Bank Group, Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, the coronavirus pandemic is having a deep and profound impact on the world. It has devastated livelihoods and economies and set back our ability to meet the aspirations of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. For countries with low levels of development, the situation is particularly dire. As the African continent, our response to the pandemic has been both strategic and collaborative. 
Our strategy in dealing with COVID-19 has been based on four pillars. The first has been in developing a continental response to the virus. This has been led by the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which in collaboration with the WHO has advised African countries on various disease control measures and protocols. The second has been in raising resources through the African Union's COVID-19 Response Fund. The third pillar has been in setting up a continental platform for the acquisition and distribution of diagnostic and therapeutic supplies to countries in need through the Africa Medical Supplies Platform. The fourth pillar has been the appointment of special envoys to engage with the international community to mobilize the financial support that African countries need. Firstly, to ensure an effective public health response to the pandemic, and secondly, to enable their economies to recover. As a country, South Africa's response has sought to save lives and protect livelihoods. While we acted swiftly to implement a nationwide lockdown which delayed the surge in infections, we also put in place significant economic and social relief measures to protect businesses, workers, and households. We introduced measures to support the poorest households and small businesses. Nevertheless, the financial fallout of the pandemic will be severe, not just for South Africa, but the entire continent. Countries will struggle to meet their obligations to their people, with critical resources having been diverted to fighting the pandemic. We are continuing to call for a comprehensive economic stimulus to assist African countries to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. We are encouraged by moves by the international financial institutions to provide relief to indebted countries and reiterate our call for a moratorium on interest and debt repayments by stricken countries. This will afford African countries the fiscal space we sorely need to rebuild our societies and our economies. For every African man, woman, and child to realize their full potential, we have to continue to invest in poverty eradication, in education, and in improving health outcomes. The pandemic has once again brought to the fore the importance and necessity of universal health care coverage. We have to turn this period of crisis into one of opportunity to build resilient economies on the African continent. We have to support the development of small businesses across the entire continent. We have to take advantage of the dramatic changes the pandemic has brought to the world of work by equipping our people with the necessary tools and skills to take up occupations in a technology-driven economy. We want to attract higher levels of investment in our natural resources sector, in renewable energies, and in agriculture. It is our intention to increase and not decrease social spending to narrow the deep inequalities that exist in our respective countries. It is only through solidarity that we will be best able to seize the opportunity presented by this pandemic to bring greater economic security to the people of Africa, to revitalize the continent's economies, and to deliver equal opportunity for all so that 
No one is left behind. We're going to focus now on the experience of individual countries to hear how they have responded to the pandemic. Have previous investments in health, education and social services helped with their current response to COVID-19? And how are they building a more inclusive and resilient recovery? Let's begin with someone who has been working at the grassroots with the poorest and most vulnerable people in India and who knows the importance of health coverage and social protection. Mirai Chatterjee is the Director of Social Security at the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, also known as SEWA. When I spoke to her earlier, I started by asking her how governments can best protect the most vulnerable, especially women and children. Well, first of all, governments like mine, India, need to invest much more in public health, particularly primary health care. Unfortunately, we have underinvested for years and therefore during the COVID crisis, we've had a pretty tough time, I must say. Second, I think we need to invest in frontline health workers, particularly women. Women frontline health workers through the pandemic in India have shown yet again that they are second to none. They're ready to take risk. They're inclusive. They are local. They know what people need. They make sure no one is left behind, particularly the most vulnerable like women and children. So invest in frontline health workers, particularly women, and of course, other health workers. We need many more nurses. We need doctors, particularly in the far-flung states of our country, like the Northeast or like Central India and Eastern India, which are traditionally underserved. And the third is infrastructure. And by that, I don't mean just buildings. Of course, in some places we'll need buildings, but we need equipment, we need supplies, we need medicines, particularly as per WHO's essential drug list. So th those are some of the things that I think we need immediately. We need to invest now and not wait for the next pandemic. Well, the informal women workers who I work with in India, I think first and foremost, the hurdle is to even understand the public health system, to have the information about what their services are, what are their entitlements, where to go, whom to approach, how to approach. These things are not known and are not immediately obvious to women at the grassroots level. And that's where the power of collectives comes in because individually it's very hard for her to access these services and entitlements. But when she is in her collective with her sisters, like cooperatives, unions, self-help groups, local groups, then she finds the strength to not only get the information, but to navigate the system and actually get access to those services and entitlements. And furthermore, once she is in a collective, it's also easier for the public health system, for the local health authorities to link up with her and her collective. So it's a win-win situation. It's a partnership that develops to make sure that these services and entitlements actually reach the last mile. And we're going to pick up on some of Mirai Chatterjee's thoughts there with our next panel in just a minute. But quickly, a reminder that there are more events to come in these World Bank Group annual meetings, and you can find the full schedule on the World Bank Live pages. Also, join the conversation using the hashtag Resilient Recovery. Now, let's take some of those ideas on how to protect and invest in people and discuss them with our next four guests. Abhijit Banerjee is one of the winners of last year's Nobel Prize for Economics. We are also joined by senior government leaders from three countries. Azusenia Arbaleche is Minister of Economy and Finance for Uruguay. Riha Denamach is the Deputy Minister of Education for Turkey. And Dr. Maya Alkela is the Minister of Health for West Bank and Gaza. Thank you very much all for joining us today. Professor Banerjee, if I could start with you, your work has focused on the best ways to alleviate global poverty. What investments should countries make for greater equity and economic growth? If you could give it to us in three top recommendations. Yeah, I'm going to, I mean, that's a million dollar question and that's sort of half of my life's work. So you want it in three minutes. I, I'll, I'll kind of pick up the things that I think this 
COVID episode has highlighted as a, as a way to just cut through the million options. I think one of the things is in, in, in terms of education, what is highlighted is how much of the potential for um, online education is unexploited. And I, think, I think that's probably the thing that uh, we've seen little pieces of research. We did research 20 years ago in fact showing that you know, computers can be very useful, but I think that research has sort of been slower than I would have thought. So I think it's one, one what we see very much is that there is an enormous capacity for scale uh, there, that, you know, there are great courses and the great courses are available, often free, but somehow the link between those courses and the children in rural Malawi are not happening. And that's, that's, that's a tragedy because in some ways they are A, deprived from school, B, uh, these courses that are available are not getting to them. I think this course is so great that we should think of ways of making them available even when school can reopen. I think that's one of the, one of the issues this has absolutely clearly highlighted. In health, health I would say what, uh, what I see as being one of the issues that I just had no sense of how important it could turn out to be is this with COVID, really, you know, this the treatment and the treatment has evolved. The new protocols are better, but this 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 was this happened pretty quickly. What hasn't yet been figured out is the public service messaging, the public the health messaging. I think one of the one thing that's really critical in this is just doing a few things uh, make a very big difference. And and I think that two, we, there's lots of experimental evidence, the kind of experimental work we do, suggesting that, for example, uh, when when you remind people that the the U.S. government is led by uh, President Trump, who often says one thing and then changes his mind or says something different, they stop trusting the what the Center for Disease Control says to them. They just they they start ignoring mess messages. And in ge more generally, we were sort of we uh, there are there's probably too many messages. Uh, mm -hmm. There's in West Bengal where we collected data, people were getting two messages a day, but they weren't following them. And we have so to find ways to get the message through to, to be uh, more concrete. Finally, on social uh, on social protection, I think it's this is completely clear that, you know, we need mechanisms of social protection that don't depend on dealing with people where they are, but where, uh, sort of deal, where they're from, but where they are. They need to deal with people where they are. Migrants need to be able to access it. Uh, and more generally, the social protection system needs to be um, flexible to say that to, in this area, we have a, a particularly big disaster. Let's send some money there. So I think that just that building in an infrastructure that's both uh, flexible and tied to an individual and at the same time sort of creating a financial base for it so that you know you have money that you can then allocate to people rather than saying well now we don't have money because we have a disaster going on I think all of that needs to be thought through in this context. Mr Banji lots to to sort of take in there we're going to talk about the education portion of that uh, coming up a bit later. But I want to uh, talk to Miss Minister Arbeleche and to hear about Uruguay, whether you have followed some of these recommendations around health, around social protections, because Uruguay does seem to have handled the pandemic well. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the World Bank for this invitation and for the chance to present to this distinguished panel the, the case of Uruguay a small but brave country in South America that, yes, has been performing well in this global fight against the COVID-19 pandemic so far, of course, still that we have enormous uh, challenges ahead. So Uruguay is a, a country with a population of almost three million and a half inhabitants. The first case of coronavirus occurred in mid-March. So far, at the end of September, there have been around 2,000 confirmations of persons with the virus and 47 deaths. Nowadays, there are only two patients in ICU, with 200 persons still recovering outside hospitals, mainly in their homes. These numbers result from a current rate of testing of more than 600 per 1 million inhabitants. But more importantly, six positives every 1,000 tests. Of course, it's always possible to improve the detection of new cases, 
the, the analysis of the whole group of indications so far allows us to declare that the pandemic is under control right now in Uruguay. So uh, how did we uh, handle this? Uh, first of all, we assured that all the resources needed to attend the health emergency would be available and we delivered. We also implemented a large uh, number of social assistance measures that played an important role in serving the most vulnerable population. Finally, we ensured the necessary measures to deal with liquidity problems that companies will go through in the face of a shock this shock we knew would be temporary but intense, so that the, the liquidity problem didn't change into a solvency problem. Since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the government took, um, was very clear to decide not to enforce a countrywide lockdown or a mandatory house confinement. Rather, it trusted citizens to adhere to voluntary social distancing and following hygiene protocols. The, the, we appeal to what we called individual freedom with social responsibility. In parallel, the government took early and decisive action and sealed off land borders, closed air traffic except to chartered repatriation flights, suspended all public events and mm -hmm. in-present school classes, limited visits, to nursing homes and encourage citizens to stay home and telework. There has been an effective coordinated response between public and private sector and the scientific community, strengthening the healthcare system and facilities and carried out, carrying out an extensive randomized testing and community okay. tracing in outbreak areas, such as the border with Brazil, which has been a trouble quite a trouble for us, and nursing homes. The government developed a roadmap for uh, opening a reopening of the different activities in consultation always with scientific experts and private sector representatives. In summary, I would say Uruguay has established uh, a successful management of the crisis, combining freedom with responsibility, scientific knowledge with political leadership, and a powerful combination of health, social, and economic measures based on our tra traditional strengths. So it sounds like policy guided by science and a clear messaging of that. But obviously, the options open to Uruguay not necessarily available in other parts of the world. Dr. Alcailo, if I could bring you in here. You are the health minister from Gaza and West Bank, and you probably, I would imagine, see a very different reality given the fragile context. Uh, that being said, West Bank and Gaza actually have shown significant progress in providing health and social services over the past years. Uh, can you tell us what particular challenges West Bank and Gaza are facing during COVID-19. How are you addressing them? Good afternoon, everybody. I am honored to be with you, uh, this high level of uh, professionals uh, from the whole globe. And uh, I'm really uh, appreciating that you involve Palestine in such an important session. Indeed, in Palestine, we have different uh, atmosphere and different... Uh, uh, indeed, in Palestine, we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, we are different than uh, than any other country and from Uruguay, uh, especially that you know that we have a political and uh, financial uh, uh, crisis these, these days. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, appreciating that the World Bank group uh, have invited us and looking for the COVID pandemic, uh, I can uh, say that uh, in March, we started the first cases in Palestine. However, we have uh, until now in West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, 50, around 50,000 cases, which was, uh, uh, which was diagnosed. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rate of, uh, uh, the rate of uh, uh, recovery is 81%. Uh, and the rate of uh, hospitality is around 5%. ICU cases, uh, only 1%. Uh, those who are using ventilators, I mean. Uh, but we have lots of challenges. Uh, out of these challenges, the first, first of all, it was a challenge. How can we 
uh, uh, prevent the spread of the uh, of, of the coronavirus in the Palestinian community, and for such and for such uh, for such we have uh, uh, responded uh, rapidly and uh, uh, starting from the presidency, uh, where they uh, also, uh, as in uh, in Uruguay, have there was a very early decision to uh, close the country, uh, whether it's education or uh, uh, public events. Uh, or uh, or schools, uh, and it was running this for one and a half months, which helped us a lot to uh, prevent the spread of the virus. However, we have uh, a challenge of the surveillance system uh, because uh, it was a, a real challenge to go ahead with uh, our uh, uh, policies. Therefore, uh, the remedies that was taken is to have uh, different levels of committees uh, that can control uh, all the policies that was taken by the government cabinet. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in this case, we have done a, what's called COVID uh, emergency higher committee, which involved uh, the six ministries, uh, Ministry of Health, Ministry of uh, Economy, Ministry of uh, uh, foreign Affairs, of internal, Ministry of Internal Affairs, Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Local Affairs uh, and Ministry of Labor uh, and, uh, uh, and also representative of the governorate and representative of the private sector. And it was all uh, uh, headed by the prime minister. And uh, um, out of this, there was different committees at the level of the community. At the governorate and communities, yeah. and this helped us a lot because at least we could have uh, uh, our information from the ground where we could take uh, have taken our decision when to lock, when to open areas, uh, what we should do in uh, on the economic and uh, in the economic uh, status uh, of Palestine, especially that we are passing through a uh, economical uh, crisis. Uh, so that coordination was key. Yes, it was a key issue, the coordination. Right. Uh, um, not, not only among the government, but um, among the government, private um, sector, and civil society. And there was a real, very good coordination and very good cooperation. And this helped us yeah. to decrease, according to WHO study that was done uh, last uh, August. Uh, um, last Sorry to interrupt you, Minister. I just wanted to, to move on and pick up on that point you talked about coordination. Uh, one thing we haven't touched on yet, but everyone has mentioned, uh, is education, and that seems to be so key, schooling. Um, I yes. want to turn to the experience of, of Turkey. Uh, Minister Denemac, you are the Deputy Minister of Education in Turkey. Uh, you have provided distance learning uh, to more than 18 million students involving 1 million teachers during school closing. Uh, how did you do this? What were the lessons you learned? Thank you, Michel. Um, I would like to extend uh, my regards to all of you. First of all, uh, believing the importance of the sharing measures, I would like to thank you for organizing uh, this crucial meeting, for inviting us and providing uh, the opportunity to exchange our experience and also internationally and uh, also enable us to learn mutually. Um, let me say something about what we did uh, is in many other countries, face-to-face -face learning was uh, discontinued last uh, March in Turkey. Uh, we were able to give a quick response uh, to compensate for the negative educational effects of the pandemic. We were able uh, to do since ministry already had an online platform, only one week after the closure uh, of schools, we uh, started distance education on our national TV channel. The ministry also provided uh, online education for primary and secondary students, uh, uh, secondary education students and education information network, which we call EBA, our online learning platform. Uh, the lessons learned in this process could be summarized as uh, 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 it is critical to reaching all students and thus all necessary measures must be taken in this respect. Our ministry established 1,420 EBA 
uh, support points uh, to reach the students who cannot participate in remote education from their home. Uh, furthermore, the GSM operators in Turkey are providing access EBA content free of charge for their users in order to avoid any internet quota problem. It is very important. Uh, the other important uh, issue is to take the necessary measures for students with the special education needs. Uh, this remote uh, education program has considered the needs of hearing impaired, visually impaired, and psychologically and mentally challenged students. They are also, uh, you know, in this program. When an online platform is created, uh, training must be designed for the use of all stakeholders, including the teachers, students, and parents. Parents also very important for distance education, especially in this age era. Our minister provided supports and maintaining uh, for teachers and all different branches for both public and private schools. Uh, these are the things, you know, I would like to say uh, yeah. about, uh, you know, the, the, what we did for uh, our 18 million uh, students and 1 million teachers in our huge uh, education system. Dr. Banerjee, uh, um, sorry, Mr. Banerjee, I saw you nodding there when Deputy Minister uh, Denimach was speaking. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, all of the all of the ministers, in a sense, echoed, I think, a similar point, which is that you have to th think in scale and think through coordination, and that, that's that's always, you know, I think the challenge in any of these things is, you, you know. You don't really usually start from a situation where you have the mechanisms available. So how do you, piv you know, pivot a, sh a big ship on a dime very quickly? And that, that that's a challenge that uh, that's why coordination is a word that keeps coming back. But al also, I think this idea of of actually having expertise. I think yeah. that's what many countries have, have just don't have the expertise on the ground. To, to do the kinds of things you described. They, they've been flailing. And in many ways, I think that one thing this brings out, I would say this episode brings out, is the need for us to share these learnings. What did you do? Why did it work? I think this this, this conversation that we're having is crucial in the sense that it's, it's the central piece of what we'll take away from this episode is, uh, you know, how do we do things better? And I think I think that the learning from the, the all the ministers' speeches were very useful for me. Uh, there's a lot to get through and not enough time, as always. But uh, Minister Abelete, a quick question. Um, you are the only finance minister here with us today. How do you convince, you know, we heard from Dr. Al Kaila there talking uh, about departments working together. How do you convince uh, or make the case to get budgets approved at a time when they are effectively constrained in part because of the because of the pandemic i think that this question has been answered by me my colleagues uh, by the different ministers uh, as we said uh, the co coordination amongst the different ministers uh, health minister um, labor social development education in uruguay as in the countries in west bank and gaza in turkey that we have just heard have been crucial, the coordination between the private sector and the public sector uh, also, the, and the coordination with the scientific community uh, has been, in the case of Uruguay, has been, I, I think, key to the way the, the, the pandemic has uh, been managed. And yes, we did present during the pan pandemic our budget law for the next year with a different focus, uh, not looking at uh, improving the fiscal accounts, that that was what we wanted to, to do when we first came in office at the, in, in March of this year. But 10 days after that, we heard about the COVID cases in Uruguay. So the focus changed completely. And we uh, started, we allocated all the resources into facing this uh, a pandemic. So are you saying that uh, that people around you understand the importance of investing in people at the moment? Absolutely, yes. And I think it, it has been uh, the, 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 the crisis, the pandemic has helped us to present the budget law for the next five years with a different focus so that what it's important is the person 
are not the uh, what the money we spent or how nice our policies are. It's the results that matter, and it's uh, the the patient, the student, people having a better house that matters, and not the the, the money we spend and what what we do. It's uh, what we achieve and and the impact we have in our people. I think that in that way the crisis has helped uh, to shift into this uh, new way of looking at the budget. Uh, very briefly uh, to Deputy Minister Demenach, uh, what is the key thing when you look at investing in people? Well, uh, our aim in all these areas in investment all uh, make sure students at the K-12, uh, including those with special education needs, have access uh, to a quality and inclusive education. Some of the concrete steps we planned uh, could be uh, why one, one is, you know, the, the, this year, this academic year, and uh, we would like to plan to shut 1,719 in total. And also the largest uh, distance education vocational development program in the history of Turkey education has been initiated. We did that things. And hybrid education system will be carried out. The theoretical part of the vocational courses will be uh, will take place through online education, while practical courses will be at, uh, at, at school. Uh, this is uh, the new thing uh, we, we are going to do in the in the future and we are going to do right now. Online and Dr. Sorry, and Dr. Al Kaila, uh, a similar question to you. I mean, uh, you have created social safety net. How do you continue to do that going forward? Uh, actually, we need to continue uh, having a social uh, uh, solidarity among the Palestinians and uh, therefore social, social security and in between brackets uh, because this is one of uh, the major issues that can help us, especially in a status where Palestine is living an economical, uh, economical crisis due to the revenues that Israel is uh, confiscating, as everybody knows. Therefore, uh, very little money we have uh, uh, been generating from the uh, Palestinian society because of the closures and uh, the low uh, and the economical uh, lockdown of the, uh, in, the in the last uh, few months, and uh, it's slowing down also in this uh, in these months. Uh, therefore, uh, there was. Uh, we, we have mobilized uh, women groups and uh, the local uh, governance uh, as uh, municipalities, uh, women groups, uh, and uh, also volunteers to work with us on different, is different uh, uh, issues. Uh, first of all, on health education, on uh, 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 giving uh, social support, whether it is by, whether it is uh, in kind donation or uh, it is. Uh, uh, on other levels. Uh, as well, we mobilize the Palestinians in the diaspora uh, mm -hmm. and they send for us uh, uh, real donations that could help us, uh, especially to uh, support those families who are in the quarantines. Mm -hmm. uh, and Al Sorry to cut you off there, Dr. Alcala. We are running out of time, uh, but I want to thank you very much and also for, for bringing up uh, the question of gender. Uh, this has been a very rich discussion, clearly a lot more to be discussed. Uh, we've had a glimpse at what different countries are doing to protect and invest in people from the long term investments that pay off when a crisis hits uh, to the policies that accelerate during a crisis. So I want to say a big thank you to all my guests for being here. And uh, I wish we had more time because clearly lots more to say on this. I'm Tom Perry in Sydney, Australia, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. I'm Michelle Flurry, and if you have just joined us, don't worry, there is still plenty to come. And there are also lots of ways to join this conversation. We'll be answering your questions live straight after this event, where we will also reveal the results of our poll. Now, a reminder, in case you missed it, we are asking, which of these will be most important for a resilient, inclusive recovery from COVID-19? Is it A, delivering vaccines to the most vulnerable, B, safely reopening schools, C, providing cash to struggling families, or D, ensuring girls and women have equal access to jobs? And you can cast your vote on the World Bank Live page. So go there now, cast that vote. 
Now, fair and equitable access to a reliable vaccine for everyone everywhere will be an important step along any road to recovery from this pandemic. Fortunately, prospects for vaccine development are bright with significant resources invested in research and development. But what about the manufacturing and distribution of a vaccine once available? That's something that my next two guests are very much involved in. Uh, Mohamed Akuji is the CEO of Imperial Logistics in South Africa, a Pan-African company. And Narenda Dev Mantena is the CEO of Biological E in India. Mr. Mantena, if I could start with you. Uh, Biological E is a, a family business that manufactures vaccine. Now, we know there is going to be huge demand for a vaccine against COVID-19, billions of doses required to ensure everyone can get vaccinated. What are local pharma companies like yours doing to prepare for the, the mass production once a vaccine is developed? What is needed to help companies do this? No, thank you, Michelle. I think uh, you know, we need to distinguish between pharma companies and vaccine companies. I think while pharma companies may have the capability, uh, they cannot just turn on vaccine manufacturing on a dime. So it is likely that the vaccine manufacturers are going to make the difference initially. Uh, so it gives some time for the pharma companies to be able to ramp up and learn the skills. So as a company, and we've been making you know, vaccines for nearly 50 years, uh, specifically for COVID, as early as February and March, uh, we, we offered two types of uh, partnerships. One was starting engaging with the Gates Foundation as well as academia to develop a, a vaccine portfolio of our own, as well as uh, uh, entry into partnerships where we can offer manufacturing services to other companies who are developing. Uh, I think that you know, given our reputation and our expertise, we were fortunate enough to attract uh, companies such as, uh, such as uh, Johnson & Johnson, where we're offering manufacturing services to them. And, uh, and I think we're also quite pleased with the development of the portfolio that we have uh, endeavored on our own. And uh, we have our own vaccine going into clinic uh, uh, next week or so. Now, from capacity perspective, uh, with the support of IFC, we've been investing in capacities in from 2017 onwards. Uh, vaccine manufacturing capacities are, are, take, are time consuming uh, and capital intensive. So fortunately, we've had some facilities that we started investing two years back that we are leveraging now uh, for COVID uh, you know, vaccine manufacturing. If everything goes well, I think by middle of next year, we hope to be able to make about 150 million doses per month uh, you know, uh, of our own and of our partners. Uh, so that's what we're doing from a manufacturing side. The second thing is, you know, it, it was diff it's difficult to predict which vaccine will succeed. So we, as a company, we decided to, through partnerships and our own development, develop a portfolio of vaccines so that, uh, so we have four vaccines in various stages of, the, uh, of development. So hopefully if one or two succeed, we'll still be able to give the large volumes what is necessary, not only for India, but the rest of the world. So a lot of foresight involved. Mr. Akuji, uh, you're the CEO of a Pan-African logistics company, distribute drugs, vaccines, other medical supplies. Once there are enough vaccine companies like Mr. Mantenas are producing them, it's your job to get them to the people who need them. From where you stand, what is needed to ensure the distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine to every person in the country? And how important are effective health systems? Uh, and what do you do if they aren't available? Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, look, I think it comes down to exactly, like you say, excess in affordability. I think on the affordability side, you know, we're going to need support from organizations like the IFC and the World Bank and the various donor organizations to support Africa in terms of, um, you know, funding for these vaccines. And then access is something that we have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. I don't believe the, the public healthcare sector has got enough capacity in many of the countries on the continent to deal with it. So uh, public-private partnerships is going to be the way to go. Um, we currently do a lot of that as Imperial with uh, governments in South Africa and across Sub-Saharan Africa, where we handle you know, the distribution of vaccines and medical supplies into remote areas. One of the things we're also going to have to do is become innovative. Um, I think the traditional channels in terms of getting uh, vaccines and pharmaceutical products to Africa is not just about COVID. I think it's a broader issue. One of the things we have done is setting up modular clinics in rural areas 
where you set up a network of uh, you know, these modular clinics that can be used as points of healthcare. And we really want to invest in that and expand that uh, on the continent because once COVID is over, then we can use those primary healthcare facilities for further medical needs for, for the many countries. So that's you know, some of the things that um, we will start doing is in, you know, in terms of improving access um, by using you know, these modular clinics, which is work quite well in South Africa. We've got about 80 of these clinics that operate across South Africa. We wanna expand that into the rest of the continent and use those as points of distribution for, um, for vaccines and any other medical supplies. I mean, are there any specific challenges of, of getting those modular clinics up and running? Not really, it, it's quite a simple process. Um, you know, it's basically a clinic in a box so it, it, it virtually can fit in a container and you can, show, you can get it to any you know, area and basically build it up or assemble it. Um, and like I say, once that clinic is been built, it can be used for primary health care for, for other types of medical supplies, not only for vaccines for COVID. It's kind of like the home improvement DIY, but brought to the medical field. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Mantena, I want to go back to a point Mr. Akuji was just talking there about uh, the, the need for private and public partnerships. He also talked about help from, from the IFC. Uh, if you can expand on that a bit more, how can we develop more local capacity for the future, including when other crises hit and other vaccines are needed? And then the second part to that question uh, is, what do you do if the problem doesn't apply to developed countries? Does that sort of make it harder? I think you know it, this is a very tricky thing in the sense that so if, if you're preparing infrastructure for the pandemic, naturally it should not be used in such a in a in a, in a manner such that uh, you can just repurpose it, and that's a challenge. Uh, so, for instance, we supply about 700 million doses to a billion doses of vaccine on a regular basis, and these are key vaccines for uh, pediatric immunization on the world. So we do have the capacity to make a billion. Once a pandemic hits, we can't stop the routine vaccination such that we can repurpose it. So what does that mean? That means we have to have excess capacity sitting idle waiting for a pandemic. And that requires significant investments and significant foresight from governments and world bodies to be able to invest in idle capacities and fund these idle capacities. Uh, the advanced countries are doing it, such as US and Europe have that, and they can afford that. And I'm afraid this is something that's not available uh, in, in the developing countries, uh, either by the governments or the private sector. From a private sector, it, it's, not, it's not feasible to have capacities that are making losses uh, either. So I think that that's a bit of a challenge that nobody's been able to solve of, of having capacities that are ready for outbreaks. The second question is for diseases that are not that are that are neglected, uh, yeah. so to speak. I think that that ecosystem has been quite good. Uh, there there are a lot of uh, uh, NGOs, a lot of uh, grants available for development of these vaccines, albeit maybe not as much as some people would want. But I think that that ecosystem of targeting uh, uh, neglected diseases is better than preparing infrastructure for pandemics and outbreaks. And, and Mr. Akaji, a final question for you. I wanted to know, uh, what are some innovative approaches? You described one, but I mean, how do you bring healthcare and vaccines to populations hard to reach? You know, I'm thinking of slums in remote areas. Are there any other innovative approaches that you're looking at? Yeah, so we are a big distributor of <clears throat> pharmaceutical products across the continent. We get to over 50,000 points of sale across the, the continent. Um, you know, just to give you a sense, we, we deliver about 43 million patient packs um, a month, uh, you know, through that distribution channel. And we can use that private sector channel as points of distribution. You know, these are our pharmacies um, and informal uh, traders as well. The challenge with vaccines will be the cold chain integrity of the, of the product because it needs to be temperature controlled. And there we have got control tower technology. And, um, you know, we have started 
uh, using that in our business to be able to monitor and make sure that those uh, vaccines or whatever pharmaceutical products that need temperature control gets monitored in giving you supply chain visibility and integrity. So um, using those uh, you know, many thousands of points of sale across the continent um, as points of uh, you know, getting the vaccines to people could be used because we go to those points of sale. We're delivering uh, pharmaceutical products two, three times a week into that network. So you know, one way is the modular clinics I described. The other way is to use the private sector in the informal space as points of distribution. It may require some investment um, you know, in terms of ensuring that those vaccines are temperature controlled in those, in those points of sale. But you could effectively use those networks as well as a, as a way to get vaccines quickly to the people. Thank you so much. I'm glad you brought up the, you know, the temperature control because I think that is one issue people have been talking a lot about. I know one of, one of the vaccines, uh, there is talk, it has to be stored very cold. Uh, many thanks to both of you for some excellent insight into uh, what's needed to ensure that everyone has fair and equal access to COVID-19 vaccines. Now, the bank's private sector arm, the IFC, is very much involved in supporting these efforts. And you can use the hashtag IFC help if you want to add your thoughts on this subject. Now, stay tuned for a special musical treat. Investing in women and girls is at the heart of the World Bank Group's work on human capital. And Bonio's Art is a hip hop group from Guinea. This special song, Avec Elle or With Her, is their anthem for the empowerment of women in Africa. Let's hear it. Nous ne voulons plus être mariés et mineurs, nous voulons nous-mêmes choisir nos maris et être propriétaires de nos terres. Nous voulons être respectés et être décideurs, ne plus être intimidés, violés. Nous voulons aller à l'école, c'est décider, franchir les étapes et faire part de nos idées, jamais plus, plus jamais exciser ou être exploité. C'est décider, franchir les étapes et faire part de nos idées Jamais plus, plus jamais exciser Ou être exploité Si c'est vrai qu'elle est l'humanité, faut plus la soumettre en vérité. Dans les mains d'une femme préparée, le monde pourrait mieux se porter. Éducation pour nos filles, égalité pour nos femmes. Alto violation jugale, mutilation génitale.
and Michelle Fleury. It's been a pleasure spending the past hour with you. And now let me return to Paul Blake in the atrium of the World Bank Group's headquarters in Washington, DC.